Good morning. We have general questions. Question number one, Mary Fee. Hey, presiding officer. Government, how it will support travellers facing disruption due to the closure of the Winchborough Tunnel in summer 2015. Minister Derek Mackay. Network Rail and ScotRail are working closely together to ensure that the Egypt electrification of the Winchborough Tunnel is delivered with the minimum disruption possible to the travelling public and that connections are maintained during the closure. Mary Fee for his response. The closure of the Winchborough Tunnel coincides with the Scottish Open Championships in St Andrews. If the Domeni Cord had been electrified first, before the closure of the Winchborough Tunnel, as was planned before 2012, trains would have been able to run via Domeni without reversing and therefore disruption could have been avoided. Does the Minister agree that this disruption on the railways during the summer could have been avoided had the Scottish Government decided not to scale back the Egypt project in 2012? Minister. No, I don't agree with that uh, assessment. I think there would have been disruption in any event. But what we are very focused on doing is recognising that there will be some disruption because working a, a live railway will always incur some disruption, but we will keep it to a minimum and we will ensure that the information is in the public domain to support the travelling uh, public in making the right travel journeys. I accept that this will cause some difficulty, but the uh, overall project surely has to be welcomed uh, along Egypt, which will lead to improved journey times, uh, uh, better trains and a, a much more efficient service. So the disruption will be worth it, but we'll do our best to keep it to a minimum. And I can advise Mary Fee, as of the, this morning, I've set up the uh, briefing for all MSPs who may be interested uh, to come along and hear about the full scale of the Egypt project and the benefits that it will bring to Scotland. Question two, Liz Smith. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what provisions there are for parents to access the medical records of their children. Minister Jamie Hepburn. A, a person who has parental responsibility for a young child can request access to the child's medical records. A young person in Scotland aged 12 or above is generally considered mature enough to understand what a subject access request is. Uh, they can make their own request and would need to provide their consent to allow their parents to make the request for them. Ms Smith. Minister, I ask the question on behalf of a constituent who, along with her husband, waited eight weeks and paid £60 to access her daughter's medical records. Uh, she and her husband were told that the communications regarding her daughter's diagnosis and treatment would be shared with health professionals, but no names or titles were given. The constituent makes the point that as a teacher and named person, she is entitled to see the medical records of other children and no one else is receiving them, but the case for her own daughter is not the same. Does the Minister believe that is acceptable? Minister. Well, I would, uh, Liz Smith will, of course, appreciate it. It's difficult for me to comment on the specific circumstances of a specific case without knowing the full uh, details. I would go back to the initial answer I gave, and it wasn't clear from Liz Smith's question whether or not the uh, youngster involved was aged 12 or less. But if a, a person has parental responsibility for a young child, uh, they should be able to request those records, and I would certainly expect uh, that that request would be fulfilled. Question number three, Jim Eady. Officer, to ask the Scottish Government when it last met the senior management of National Museum Scotland and what issues were discussed. Cabinet Secretary Fiona Hislop. Uh, I met with the Chair and Director of National Museum Scotland on the 4th of December 2014 to discuss strategic priorities for the next uh, few years. Jim Eady. Is the Cabinet Secretary aware of the growing anger among staff over the changes to the weekend working allowance which has created a two-tier workforce at the National Museums of Scotland? Can I tell her with regret that the approach of the management is widely viewed by the workforce as being arrogant and dictatorial given that these changes were introduced without any prior engagement with the trade unions? Can I very much welcome the interest which she has taken in this matter and her ongoing willingness to engage in a constructive fashion with the staff and the employer and can I urge her to continue to encourage the museum to reach a resolution to this dispute. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, we will be aware that it, it is not the job of ministers to interfere with employee and employer relations. However, there are real concerns about this issue. Uh, the MSP concerned, Jamidi, has raised with it, this with me on a number of occasions. Uh, when I met with the management and the chair um, in both March last year and December, I made quite clear uh, what the government's expectations were of both the standard style and tenor of uh, negotiations that took to take place. Uh, I can say that there has been progress. Also, I have met with 
uh, PCS and other trade union members um, over the period of October and November. And indeed, my understanding from the most recent uh, dialogue between the union and the management is that uh, at December is that there's been progress made on a number of issues, including bringing forward, for example, a living wage from August to April. Um, the discussions on no compulsory redundancy has been extended 14, 15, 15, 16. Um, but obviously there are issues around the weekend uh, allowance, which uh, was changed in 2011. Um, the people who already have, those staff that already have that allowance will continue to have it. Uh, but in terms of those discussions, they are ongoing. And as recently as December, there were discussions about looking at issues around rotas, time off leave, etc. Because I absolutely value um, the contribution that both the staff and the management make. And, President Officer, just to relay that this year, uh, this week alone, it was announced that for the fourth year in a row, the National Museums of Scotland um, was the, the most visited tourist attraction in Scotland. And we should all place on record our thanks to the staff particularly, but also to the management, for contributing to that success. Sarah Boyack. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for her answer this morning and say that there, there still appears to be a challenge between the Minister's general aspirations and support for our magnificent uh, museum service and the reality of the, the staff experience on a day-to-day -day basis and the issues of part-time working uh, increasing in the museums is something I raised with the Minister last year um, and she said that she couldn't take um, a prescriptive interest in the conditions of staff but the, the point about having well-trained, committed staff, given the cost of living in Edinburgh, there are clearly major concerns amongst PCF staff that their terms and conditions have been limited and that that is causing major hardship for many of the staff. Cabinet Secretary. Well, well quite clearly, as I set out, uh, nobody has had um, their... Uh, pay reduced as a result of, this, of the decision that was taken back in 2011. I agree with her that it's important that we have good and constructive uh, management trade union relations and ongoing dialogue. Uh, that's what I have facilitated and encouraged. And as part of the progress, which I also didn't um, uh, perhaps relay in my answer to the first question, is that um, the National Museum's uh, shop staff, who are not party to uh, government pay policy, uh, are now receiving the living wage because the management recognised that was the right thing to do. So across the board, the progress is being made. I know there are frustrations, and some of it is historic, but I'm absolutely certain that the commitment that's been given to me by the management to engage in a constructive manner, particularly with the local members of, the, of PCS, uh, will be taken forward, and I will be monitoring this very closely. Question number four, Patrick Harvey. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government, in light of the First Minister's comment that there should be zero, to zero tolerance on tax avoidance, what policy changes it, in it plans to make? Cabinet Secretary John Swinney. Mr. Officer, the Scottish Government is determined to act decisively on tax avoidance where we have powers to do so. Tax avoidance is not welcome in Scotland. We have legislated for a general anti-avoidance rule for the devolved taxes, which is significantly wider than the UK's general anti-abuse rule and that will enable Revenue Scotland to take robust action to counteract tax avoidance. As I have said previously to this Parliament, the Scottish Government is always open to considering ways in which we can strengthen our already robust approach to tackling tax avoidance in relation to devolved taxes. Patrick Harvey. I'm grateful to the Deputy First Minister for his answer, and he was quite right to put a general anti-avoidance rule uh, into the heart of Revenue Scotland's uh, approach to its work from day one. Uh, I commend him for that decision. But there are other things that we could do, even with devolved powers, uh, to show a zero-tolerance approach. Does he agree, for example, that individuals or companies that engage in tax avoidance, for example, through the use of uh, tax havens should be debarred from public appointments or from taxpayer-funded grant schemes like RSA. Would that not send the right signal that there is a zero-tolerance approach for tax avoidance in Scotland? Cabinet Secretary. I think when I, when I look at this, this issue, there is a, a commentary uh, which generally says that the Scottish Government has, as Mr Harvey has uh, complimented, uh, taken a very strong approach on the earliest decisions that we have had to take in relation to uh, tax collection to make it absolutely clear that we uh, will tackle tax avoidance wherever we can identify that. And by setting the uh, bar as high as we have set it with the general anti-avoidance rule, we aim to do that. As I said in my opening answer, I am certainly prepared to consider other measures to ensure that um, 
we properly tackle uh, tax avoidance and um, if Mr Harvey has particular suggestions to make then I will of course consider those as I have made clear to Parliament I will consider on all occasions. Lewis MacDonald. Thank you very much. Does the Cabinet Secretary further agree with Dave Watson of Unison who has suggested that the tax practices of potential contractors should be taken into account in Scottish Government decisions uh, on procurement? Cabinet Secretary. Well, as, as Mr Macdonald will know, the Government has to observe a wide variety of particular considerations in relation to procurement decisions, uh, principally informed by the obligations of our participation within the European Union. Um, but uh, as I make clear, we are able to legislate um, to establish the highest degree of intolerance of tax avoidance. We have done that in the general anti-avoidance rule and we will seek to apply that in whichever circumstances we can. Question number five, James Dornan. I will provide an update on the work it is supporting in Malawi. Yes, sir, Hamza Yusuf. I thank the member for the, the, the question. Since the signing of the cooperation agreement in 2005, uh, the Scottish Government has provided over £53 million to development work in Malawi. On January the 28th, I announced £9.2 million of new funding for 20 development projects in Malawi. The member will also be aware, I know from his recent visit, that uh, torrential rain has caused uh, terrible uh, impact in, in terms of flooding in many parts of uh, Malawi. The Scottish Government contributed £150,000 uh, towards the initial relief effort. Of course, we're considering what other uh, contributions we can continue to make. And if he keeps his eye open after FMQs, he'll also see that we've uh, given some funding towards some small grant, uh, small, smaller Scottish NGOs for some smaller grants. Uh, some of those are also in Malawi too. James Dolan. I thank the Minister for that answer. And uh, as he mentioned, I have just recently visited Malawi and been lucky enough to see a fantastic example of the work Mary's Meals do throughout the country at Matindi Primary School, a project supported by both my old school, Holyrood, and one of the schools in my constituency, Langside Primary School. Could the Minister tell me how the Government is ensuring that these links continue to flourish? And does he agree with me that these links, which benefit primarily the children of Malawi, are also of huge importance to the pupils from Scotland who have the privilege to assist in these projects? Minister? I do agree with everything uh, the Member says. I think uh, Mary's Meals has a uh, collective uh, universal appeal across this chamber, actually. Uh, because of the simplicity of what it does, but also the great impact that it manages to, to do on the ground. The Scottish Government, successive Scottish Governments, including our own, of course, uh, have provided support uh, to Mary's Meals, and I'm pleased uh, about that. I also accept his point very much that it's two-way. Uh, the development is two-way, and we have to ensure that we are teaching our children as the uh, current curriculum does in terms of global being a good global citizen and global citizenship. Uh, through the funding that the Scottish Government has given to the development education centres across Scotland, we hope to do that. It's important because uh, we want Scotland to be known as a good global citizen. And although there will always be those who will have negative comment on giving uh, aid overseas to the poorest, if we embed being a good global citizen in our children now and future generations, when they have children, grandchildren and so on and so forth, hopefully that will continue for future generations uh, to come. Uh, Jimmy McGregor. Um, thank you. Can the Minister please give an update on the success of the Malawi Renewable Acceleration Programme, which is funded by the Scottish Government, and whether or not it has met the aim of empowering the targeted communities? Minister? Yes, I'm delighted. I'll send the, the, the member the full brief in terms of, uh, in terms of the outcomes and uh, what they've managed to achieve, but it has been one of our most successful programmes. In Malawi, I got to see it myself when I went to Blantyre Polytechnic and saw the range of renewable solutions through our innovation in Scotland that were helping the poorest in the ground. And these were some real-life stories which are excellent. From, from the Emirate programme, for example, uh, a woman in a town just near the Malangi Mountain became the first ever, this is in the 21st century, of course, in 2014 when I was there, became the first ever person in that town to give birth in a room with a light in it. And that's the kind of thing that the Emreet project is doing, not just strategies, not just documents, not just funding programmes, but actually changing lives on the ground. But in terms of his wider question, I'll send him the full detail of how the Emreet uh, programme has progressed successfully. Question number six, Claire Baker. To ask the Scottish Government what discussions it has had with Burnt Island Fabrications Limited regarding reports of potential job losses. Minister, Fergus Ewing. Uh, also, the Scottish Government is concerned to hear of potential redundancies at Burnt Island Fabrications, and I appreciate this will be a difficult time for the company's employees and their families. Scottish Enterprise met with the BIFAB management on the 13th of this month, and the proposed job losses were raised at that meeting. The local PACE chair has also met with the company 
and has provided information on the tailored support that can be made available to any employees facing redundancy. Claire Baker. I thank the Minister for the answer. Uh, would the Minister be happy to meet with me and with BIFAB to support the company during this difficult time, as the Minister recognises they are facing a number of redundancies and it is causing great concern for the current workforce? Uh, no one wants to see job losses and we must do all we can to ensure that BIFAB is able to have the skills and capacity to, to deliver on new contracts. Can I ask the Minister to say what action the Government will be taking to support BIFAB in these efforts, particularly in securing some of the forthcoming debt contracts and also help grow the energy park? Minister. Yes, I, I can uh, uh, provide information to the member. First of all, Scottish Enterprise has invested £24 million in the energy park alongside uh, Fife Council. Uh, secondly, uh, Adrian Gillespie met with uh, John Robertson at BIFAB on the 13th of February. Uh, a number of positive actions have been discussed at that meeting and will be taken forward. Thirdly, I am in virtual constant uh, contact with companies that are involved in the offshore wind and oil and gas sector, uh, markets which BIFAB has already succeeded in winning and will continue so to do. Fourthly, I have been involved in visiting BIFAB both in Burnt Island and also in Arnish in the Western Isles, uh, where Highlands and Islands Enterprise have also supported the company. Uh, fifthly, we have put in place an apprenticeship scheme to ensure that any apprentice in the oil and gas sector made redundant is able to complete their job training and with a financial incentive of £5,000 to encourage another employer to recruit the apprentice, we are doing as much as we possibly can. We value the work that BIFAB does. We will continue to work very, very closely with them and their team to do everything possible that they will continue to uh, provide a very successful business for Scotland. Question seven, Gavin Brown. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on the establishment of the Scottish Business Development Bank. Cabinet Secretary John Swinney. So we aim to make an, an official announcement on the establishment of a Scottish Business Development Bank later in the autumn. The aim of the Business Development Bank is to help address the needs of those uh, 100,000 small and medium-sized enterprises in Scotland who employ staff and, who grow the, and to grow the number of high-growth businesses that Scotland needs. Gavin Brown. Presenting officer, the bank was announced for the first time almost two years ago. Uh, given the Scottish Government said they could start a new country in 18 months, uh, can he please tell us how big will this bank be and when will it actually be open for business? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I, 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 I would have thought that um, uh, Mr Brown might have welcomed the progress that I set out. He's always, uh, he's, always keen to, he's, always hear, he's always keen to hear about the progress that I set out to Parliament, so I, I told him that we plan to make an official announcement in the autumn. Um, as Mr Brown well knows, there are challenging issues around the interaction of a business development bank with the public finances, uh, under which the rules under which we have to operate within the precious United Kingdom. So, uh, as a consequence of that, we have, to tread, we have to tread with great care to make sure that we take decisions and take actions that are consistent with the accounting framework within which we have to operate. And those are the issues with which I have been wrestling for some time and continue to wrestle. But as soon as I have some answers, I will share them with Mr Brown. He will be one of the first to know. Question 8, Colin Keogh. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government whether there is an, update, whether there is an up to date estimate of PFI and PPP costs in the Edinburgh Western Parliamentary constituency. Cabinet Secretary John Swinney. President Officer, information on the cost of PFI and PPP projects is updated annually and made available through the Scottish Government website. <coughs> within West Edinburgh, the Edinburgh Schools PPP bundles 1 and 2 includes provision for schools within the Edinburgh West Parliamentary constituency. The revenue cost of both bundles in 2014-15 is anticipated to be £39.2 million. Colin Keir. I thank the Deputy First Minister for his answer. And would he agree with me that the local authorities like Edinburgh would today have far more money to spend on local services if they weren't saddled with the billions of pounds of debt by the failed PFI agenda of the previous Labour and Liberal executive? And is it not about time that these parties actually owned up to uh, their part in creating this mess? Cabinet Secretary. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. As I shared with Parliament in the budget process, the total repayment on PFI contracts in 2014-15 for the whole of Scotland is £952 million in 2014-15, 
and it will breach the £1 billion level in 2017-18. Now, what I cannot understand, presiding officer, is why my predecessors in office decided to saddle the country with PFI debts when they were leaving budgets unspent in the possession of Her Majesty's Treasury at exactly the same time. When we came to office, £1.5 billion of expenditure was unspent by our predecessors. It demonstrates a lack of financial competence by our predecessors and it shows their lack of interest in investing sustainably yeah, yeah. in the infrastructure of our country. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Before we move to the next item of business, members.